I was approached by Diane Weirman, a participant, about making a film about water. And of course, as a filmmaker, I was excited because I thought, water, you know, it's so visual and beautiful. And I was imagining all of the fountains and waterfalls and droplets that we could film. But then, of course, my second thought was, if participant makes, wants to make a film about water, then whatever is happening with the resource must be much more dire than what I am assuming. It's the third week in a row without any water. The army has been called in to protect the capital's water pumps. This perception we like to have about water as this pure, unlimited resource, and then the reality, which is uh, pretty shocking. So when I was uh, thinking about how to do the film, I realized that I had so many questions. And so it wasn't just about scarcity or about issues of contamination or about issues of conflict. I wanted to see how those pieces fit together. So this was my very ambitious approach to try to figure out, is there a way to make a film that can connect the dots where we get a sense of what is it that we're really facing? I guess that was the bottom line, what I wanted to know. And how do we make this an issue that people feel urgent about doing something about when we still live in a country where you can turn the tap and water comes out? Whenever it rains, people think whatever drought is happening is over. You know, you have this kind of inter insurmountable psychological uh, you know, obstacle because it's very hard for it to feel real and that was a big challenge in the film to make the potential for the resource um, being unavailable, to make that sort of viscerally understood. So that's what we tried to do in the film. The production of oil reaches a peak and then inevitably starts to decline. Like peak oil, there is peak water. We're reaching the limits of what we can use. Everyone in the film needed to be a character, not just someone supplying information. And I remember thinking, we need an, an Aaron Brockovich, you know? And we talk about, we need an Aaron Brockovich. Let's look for, and finally I said, what about Aaron Brockovich? <laughs> We're like, duh. And so, you know, we, we uh, looked into what she was doing, and sure enough, she was still very much on the ground, in the trenches, across the country, dealing with uh, communities that had uh, very serious water issues and there were more and more cropping up all the time. So it was a, one of those um, situations where we started filming with her and then things naturally came up like uh, Hinckley, the original case from the movie Aaron Brockovich popping up again with further contamination. So her story became not just a touch point but something that was evolving on its own. I personally like the idea that the resource uh, can be that the the situation can be managed that you know if you talk to people about let's just fix this problem people get overwhelmed they say you know how can we do this but if you say look these ways that we can manage this there's things we can do about efficiency there's things that on a personal level will make a difference over a lifetime so I think that's a much more graspable way for people to uh, to approach something as uh, difficult and fundamental as um, feeling that, they're, they're, that water might not be um, as, as infinite as we've been uh, able and privileged to expect over our lifetimes. Our experts in the film, they have had uh, their work and their continued struggle, and I do use the word very intentionally, has taken a real personal toll. I mean, it's, you know, it's like that, that long, it's now, this time it's personal. I mean, they're really invested in a way that I think makes them uh, really sympathetic and, um, and I really see the, the scientists in the film as, as heroes. Um, but my own personal view is probably closest to Tyrone's when in the end of the film he says, you know, no species lives forever. And maybe, you know, Humans, we can sort of imagine the, the end, but we don't have to speed along and you know, hasten our demise. There's ways that we can honor what we've had by trying to um, you know, mitigate the damage that we've caused. Water is everything. The single most necessary element for any of us to sustain and live and thrive is water. When, uh, when we were making Last Call, uh, especially in talking to 
uh, Jay Familietti and Peter Glick, uh, occasionally the talking about conservation and efficiency, but then there was always the asterisk. But of course, you know, population growth, that's the thing, that's the, the elephant in the room in a way. When we finished with Last Call, at every Q&A, it seemed somebody would stand up and say, well, why are we talking about conservation when we can't control population? I mean, why aren't you making a film about population? They said it nicer than that. But we had already been thinking about the role of population growth. And so that led to the film that we've currently just finished with participant called Misconception. And uh, I, I love that this film came out of, uh, out of Last Call because it seems like kind of a continuing inquiry. Um, but the other thing I loved is that my expectation about what was really happening with population was constantly upended in the research and the filming of this film. So I feel like the unexpectedness of it is what kind of motivates the storytelling in the film.